and I come to this conference as both a lobbyist uh, from my, my company, Motion Picture Licensing Company, we do non-theatrical licensing around the world in 33 countries, but I also come as an insider. I was a member of the British Parliament uh, from 2010 to 2015, and therefore I'm actually British, although working in America, which is why the moderator said I was from America. And I was the first ever intellectual property advisor to the Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, for 2013 and 2014. And that was the first time in Parliament's 400 year history. So I know how difficult it is to get governments to listen and change legislation. And what it takes to get an idea from just being an idea to actually a law. Now I'm very mindful that everyone here has different perspectives and I'm going to come from a Western, certainly UK perspective. So, so but hopefully what I've got to say will be relevant to all jurisdictions. So when I joined Parliament uh, in the UK in 2010, the UK was on the slippery slope downwards. We'd had the Hargreaves report, and they've been very influenced by people like the Open Rights Group, who were saying we should just give away rights. Now, and also, legislators had no idea what IP really stood for. And I kid you not, when I said to one MP, oh, I, I work in IP, he said, how do you spell that? I mean, it really was going that way. And I would argue that right now, Britain is probably number one in the world for intellectual property um, uh, protection. And indeed, all three parties in the 2015 election had intellectual property rights protection written into their manifestos. That was the first time ever that had happened in the history uh, of Britain. And the Conservative Party even put one of mine in the uh, manifesto on intellectual property rights. And uh, that was the first time it might be even mentioned in the Conservative Manifesto ever. So uh, how do we go about getting this transformation from 2010 and the wrong way to in 2015 and beyond, I think, in one of the world leaders? Now, no matter how good your argument is, the bottom line is that most legislators, like the public, find intellectual property confusing, not a vote winner for their constituents, of less importance than the economy and the health service and that sort of thing. And let's be honest, most people find intellectual property boring. Long, well-drafted papers, no matter how well-intentioned or how well-crafted, don't get read by members of parliament. I know that from personal experience. You just put them in the bin if it's not of relevance to you. And neither is hosting talks or receptions. These things are great, but we're talking to ourselves. We're not talking to people who don't know much about intellectual property. Of course, MPs do like celebrity pictures, that's one way of getting a celebrity uh, to uh, MPs to interact, but it's not the only way. The big, big breakthrough in lobbying is to make it personal. Now, legislators have more than one eye on the next election, so you've got to help them get elected. But here's the dilemma. Intellectual property is not a vote winner. For this reason, lobbyists need to uh, identify innovative ways of getting their message across. This might be taking parliamentarians to a local school or a company that they've got a particular relevance in their constituency. And all those things need to they take time. And you can't do it as an individual, ask your local MP to do that more than occasionally. So you need to get your local associations involved. Now, I'm going to mention this a few times. Every single person in this room will belong to an association of some sort. But I reckon virtually none of you have ever asked your association, what are you actually doing? And what are you, what's your agenda on intellectual property rights with the legislators? They will have someone who deals with that and they'll report on it. But I, I personally am a member of a couple of accountancy associations and I don't even lobby them very hard. And that's a mistake, we should all do that. Um, and it's not just my view. I met with a couple of weeks ago with a very high-ranking civil servant at the Intellectual Property Office in London. And she said exactly the same. We've got to make it personal and make it count. Otherwise, no one is listening. So how did I do this in Parliament when I was a member of Parliament? I started two competitions. One was Rock the House and one was Film the House. And what it did is it basically got young filmmakers and musicians to apply part of the competition. And it then to apply through their member of Parliament and suddenly I had all these members of Parliament coming up to me and saying, why is this 16-year-old band coming to me and wanting to do this competition? And I said, well, let me explain about the intellectual property and their creative rights and how important this is for our country. 
And it turned out that Rock the House turned out to be the largest ever competition in Parliament's history, with over 450 out of 650 MPs taking part. So we were getting it through with that one way. Now, imagine everyone in this room, you've got four minutes with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He's running between two meetings, and he comes up to you and says, Mike, or everyone here, what would we, should we do about intellectual property rights? Now, I'll give you all a moment to think about that. You've got the Prime Minister of Great Britain asking you what you're going to do about intellectual property rights. Now, the easy answer is to say we should strengthen the laws, we need to crack down more, and that sort of thing. But, the Prime Minister doesn't want your ethereal messages of we should just do more. He wants specifics, real specifics. And that's a difficult, difficult uh, 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 demand. And what's, what's even harder is when rights holder groups do campaign, they tend to campaign on small nuances, like the private copying exception or, or something like that. They often miss the real big pictures about what to do. So, what would be your recommendation to the Prime Minister of Great Britain if he said to you, what's the one thing we should be doing? Now, for me, it's about follow the money. If we can stop the advertisers going on the illegal sites and making and making all the illegal people making money, then that's a real, real deterrent. The second group is a lot more difficult, and those, that's the people who consume the illegal content. Because as the Prime Minister made it clear to me, the last thing he wants to do is start locking up errant teenagers. That's not his policy, that's not good with the electorate, that's not what he's going to do. He's going to find, he wants to find a way that we don't have to lock anyone up at all. And we don't actually want to enforce rights, we want to stop people doing it. So we have to change the culture. So I came up with the Prime Minister with three concepts. The first was education, the second was carrot, and the third was stick. The first step has to be education. We really must win the hearts and minds back of the people of our countries who think it's absolutely okay to download illegal material. Um, I speak to a lot of students at universities and I ask them to put their hand up if they've ever downloaded anything illegal. And if I did that here, it all put your hands up probably as well. And I ask the students, why are you doing it? And they say, well, we, 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 we wouldn't have bought it anyway, so no one's being affected by it. Um, they're rich and they can afford it. We've heard all those arguments. And I hope no one here, I have to explain to you why it, uh, intellectual property rights uh, protection is important. Or maybe I do, because I heard this morning that the Taiwanese government stopped doing um, site blocking because there was a big pressure from the students that they didn't want it, they didn't like it. Well, that means they don't really understand. And I often ask the students who put their hands up, and I say, who knows here that you're destroying the music industry? And about half put their hand down, half keep it up. I said, well, you know, there's two things wrong.